talk to us as a global regional response. You weren't just like build it here. You were like, no, this is a bigger than us approach. And we spent a lot of time with them. And, and I will tell you, one of the things to understand is this is not a finished product. So I'm going to say that. We are like dating. So we're going to tell you, you're like our parents. And we just now brought the girl home. And we're going to introduce her to you. Okay, so that's what this is about. You still have your chance to object. You still have your chance to say not good enough. You still have your chance to say, I love it. Um, you have all kinds of opportunities to go through a process. Washington State is a very process-driven state. There's still permitting to go. There's public comments to go. There's all kinds of things. So I didn't want to give anybody any misidea that something was different than it was. But what it is is exciting because we have a company who's sat down and said, we're putting a stake on some land in your community, and we want to be here. And we're willing to talk about the process. And so we got a chance to meet their new CEO of Fortescue, uh, Fortescue Future Industries. And he's with me today, and I'm going to invite him up, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Brown. So, and, you know, we're, we're very excited to be making both of those announcements. Uh, our agreement, uh, we've reached an agreement with the Industrial Park of Transalta for a piece of property that's right next to the uh, retiring Transalta or uh, Centralia coal plant. And um, one of the things we're excited about is that that, uh, that workforce, which is going to become available in 2025 because of the retirement of that coal-fired power plant, um, is exactly the kind of folks we're going to need when we go into, into uh, operation in 2026 for our green hydrogen. So the timing uh, couldn't be better. And uh, there's about 120 people working at that uh, coal-fired power plant. We need about 140. Um, so uh, as our chairman once said to me, we, we don't just need them. We need their brothers and sisters. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to 
create a lot of opportunity for, for folks who need it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, I'm really proud to work for this company, Forest Street Future Industries. We're an Australian company. Um, and how did an Australian company find its way to Centralia? Well, um, we went looking for a couple of things. One is we need a lot of renewable resources for our, to power our products. And uh, this is a, a region that is ahead of the rest of the world in, um, in decarbonizing its power grid. Your power grid is already almost 100% uh, clean energy renewable fuel. And uh, as we just heard a moment again, uh, go by 2030, uh, you'll finish the job and be 100% uh, renewable. Congratulations. Uh, there's not many places in the world like that. And so that's part of what brought us here. Um, another thing that we came looking for is a willing community. And as you just heard up here, um, that is uh, something that we found in space. Not just the, the local folks, you know, the fact that the state of Washington has set really aggressive decarbonization goals, net zero goals. That's all an important part of creating the kind of uh, framework that we need to be successful in what we're trying to do. Um, and, and we also found, you know, uh, a, a retiring coal fired power plant that has a lot of the kind of things that we need in, in the digital workforce. Um, we need water to make our product. We need a small fraction of the amount of water that a coal fired power plant uses in, for cooling purposes. But those water rights um, are important uh, and are part of what brought us here. Uh, we found all the other infrastructure that comes with a coal fired power plant. The rail that brings coal in is the same rail that could bring our product out. Um, the, uh, uh, the switch yard that's outside of that power plant, we need a switch yard. The electrical interconnect uh, that, that they have is the kind of thing that makes our, our project possible. So all these kind of things that are otherwise sort of useless assets after this power plant goes out of uh, operation, we plan to repurpose them and give them a whole new lifeline of another 40, 50, 60 years um, until the next thing comes along that makes what we're doing uh, look, look like you know the old stuff. Uh, but you know, so our company, our parent company, um, is uh, the world's fourth largest iron ore producer. Um, they've set a target to get to 2030 to, to get to net zero emissions by 2030. Uh, most companies are talking about 2050. We're talking about 2030, which is just being short of the way. One of our goals is at the top is to decarbonize our, our company. Um, one of the benefits of having a parent company that's the fourth largest iron ore producer in the world is uh, we're very well funded. So they've, they've allocated about a billion dollars a year to our company um, to, to do the kind of things that we're doing here in Centralia. So one thing you should all know is we, we're a startup company, but we're a pretty well financed startup company. Um, and you know we've got the, the balance sheet to do a, a really ambitious project with this. So what about this project? Well, uh, so Jack Peet here has been uh, boots on the ground for the better part of the year trying to figure out is this the right place for us um, to announce one of our first projects globally. And, uh, and I'm very happy to tell you that we've come to the conclusion that it is for all the reasons I just announced. Um, again, we're, today is all about going public so we can begin the kind of engagement we need to do to get a project like this done. But I want to, again, in all humility, tell you that we're just getting started. And there's a lot of work to do. We have, we have permitting work that we have to do that's very important. We're very hopeful that the state government is you know, the governor's office is going to be cooperative you know, with us in helping uh, you know, uh, accelerate that permitting to the extent possible. Um, and we you know, really would appreciate that kind of support. But you know, if, if, we, if we move as fast as we hope we could, um, we could be uh, ready to make a final investment decision in the 2024 time frame and be producing hydrogen in the 2026 time frame. Um, if things take a little longer than those dates, we you know, move out by six, 12 months, but that's about the kind of time frame that we're looking at. So uh, one of the things Jack's done is, is created a great flyover model so that we can show you what it's going to look like when it's, when it's actually in, in operation. And uh, is somebody ready to, uh, to launch that? Or... Thanks. So I'm just going to narrate a little bit as we fly over. So we are a global company, so you know we start at the highest point. We look all over the world for you guys, and uh, we can make it down to the state of Washington. 
Washington and Lily. Got on the ground and saw a lot of renewable energy. Um, saw wind turbines. Saw hydropower. Saw uh, sources of water. We found a, a coal fired power plant and a piece of land that was developed in their facility just like ours. What you see here is what that facility will look like. Lots of electric So um, I want to close just by thanking some folks, and um, I'm going to read this because um, my good friend Jack P. here is, is the one who's really been interacting with most of these folks. But uh, Representative Peter Abarno, Abarno um, from the Bipartisan Hydrogen Caucus in the Washington State Legislature, I uh, want to thank you very much. The Energy Innovation Coalition, in particular, uh, Mayor Kelly Smith Johnston and Joe Clark from Twin Transit, uh, who were the ones who really saw the, some of the early ones who saw the potential for this hydrogen valley concept in Lewis County that was discussed earlier. Of course, the, the Lewis Economic Alliance and, and Richard DeBolt, who's been just absolutely, uh, you know, uh, one of our, our greatest uh, allies and supporters in, in making contacts that we needed. And I said, and I think last I just would like to thank all of you for coming. Um, I, there's some familiar, familiar faces for me from sort of the renewable power and green hydrogen industry um, who came here, I think, maybe to cheer me a little bit for us. And I, I really want to thank you, all of you, and, and uh, get a chance to shake some hands afterwards for folks I haven't had a chance to meet face to face during this pandemic. Uh, Mayor, you know, thanks so much for uh, your support and for uh, allowing us uh, here site and again we just you know really look forward to reaching out to all of you um, and convincing you that this is a great project for your community and that we're going to be a great partner for your community. Thanks very much.
those pictures on the panel. Uh, we didn't use it last time, so maybe we can use it this time. Um, I will tell you that I'd also like to thank my board of directors um, for allowing us the opportunity, my, my organization the opportunity, and allowing me the flexibility to go out and work on all kinds of different projects, whether it's housing infrastructure, uh, sewer, or hydrogen, or just trying to do what we can. So I just want to thank my board as long as people get thanked. Um, I'm going to introduce somebody up here uh, in a moment who's a sponsor of Twin Transit, Joe Clark. Well, I guess I just introduced you, so it's not in a moment. So Joe, come up. Um, I just want to tell you that uh, Ed Orca and Joe Clark um, and with the hydrogen fueling station did something remarkable because it was just this little flicker of a flame and everybody was like, why? Why? Why, why are we doing this? And, and um, Ed was the one that said, if we're going to build one, I want it in my district. And he held firm to that. And I really want you to know that your little plane has turned into a bigger movement than I don't think any of us anticipated. So thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> so besides being a co-chair of the uh, EIC with me, uh, Joe Clark is the head of our Twin Transit. As we know, our Twin Transit has grown and is moving into the renewable space. He's going to introduce his panel and talk to you a little bit about what they got going on. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask some folks to come and join me. Back if you join me, Josh Jacobs from PSC. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Jason from Toyota of North America. Come on up. Jennifer States from Maritime Blue. Thank you, Chet from PSC. Are you here? Yes, there he is. I saw him earlier. And then Ryan Reed from Kenworth. If you'd all join me. You know what? Uh, you've heard. You got one more. You got. You got. Here you go. That's all right. Thank you. Um, you've heard uh, Richard talk. Mining regions 
um, running downhill forward line or and charging the battery using the gravity um, of that forward line or locomotive as it travels down to the port and then using that battery um, charge to run the train back up hill when the train's empty and we're calling that the Infinity Train Project. Um, so that's what Fortescue Metals Group is doing. Uh, Fortescue Future Industries is exclusively focused on green hydrogen. Um, we're in the process of putting a hydrogen electrolyzer at the mine sites in, in the northwest of Australia. Um, and that will power 10 hydrogen electric buses, um, hydrogen fuel cell electric buses uh, that will operate on the mine. In our technology centre in Perth in Western Australia, we're operating a mining truck on hydrogen, a drill rig on hydrogen, um, a locomotive engine on a 90% green ammonia fuel, which is a, um, another form of, of carrying hydrogen fuel. So those are just a couple of things. And it was just a couple. exciting that when, when, when I came here and met you, Joe, you were in the process of um, procuring hydrogen electric buses. So, um, it was just exciting that when I first came out here, we were speaking the same language, um, but from opposite sides of the globe, it was, it was pretty cool. It, it really was cool, and uh, the synergy was instant almost with our teams. Really great. Uh, Jason, I want to come to you. Um, early on, um, it was Jason from Toyota of North America and Evan from Bonneville Environmental and Dave Warren from Washington Green Hydrogen and Gary Eichel from Lewis County D. Five of us kind of came together and started talking about some hydrogen things. And Toyota's moving really fast into this space, and uh, they've made a lot of commitments, and not just in cars, but in other vehicles too. Why don't you just talk a little bit about Toyota's roles in the hydrogen space? Sure, yeah. So, uh, Toyota, hydrogen is a very important part, we think, in terms of decarbonizing transportation. Uh, I think the writing's on the wall for battery electric. Clearly, that has a, a large role to play. But to fully decarbonize transportation, you're going to need both powertrain technologies. There are some use cases where just from a, a usability standpoint, from a customer demand standpoint, a battery electric powertrain is not necessarily suitable. It's somewhat akin to how, you know, in some use cases you need a diesel engine, it's better. In some use cases, a regular gasoline internal combustion is better. They're just different powertrain technologies. They have their pros and cons. Um, you know, Toyota has our Challenge 2050, which is uh, essentially our net zero uh, decarbonization goal by 2050. Uh, and we're actively working towards implementing that through various uh, environmental plans we have internally. Uh, fuel cell plays a key role in that. Uh, we started developing fuel cell technology around the same time we started developing technology for the Prius. Um, Prius, you know, obviously was a little closer to um, uh, uh, commercial market maturity. Than